Iran and Russia agree to boost bilateral cooperation in uh, security and military spheres. Iranian Defense Minister Hossein Dehran and his Russian counterpart Sergei Shoigu have signed an agreement following negotiations in Tehran. The agreement calls for the developing of and strengthening, rather, of military and defense ties between the two countries based on mutual interests. Both sides agreed to cooperate in their fight against terrorism, separatism, and extremism. Shoigu arrived in Tehran for a two-day official visit late on Monday. He's also scheduled to hold talks with the chief of staff of the Iranian Armed Forces, General Hassan Firuzabadi. Iran and Russia are boosting their economic cooperation, planning to switch to their national currencies and bilateral trade. Three measures are underway within the framework of this agreement, including opening of a joint bank account by Iran and Russia, presence of several Russian banks in Iran, and choosing a Russian bank for real-based trade exchanges in that country. Russia's mere business bank is ready to render financial services to Iranian traders, according to a recent deal signed by Iran and Russia. The two countries have been looking for alternative ways of expanding bilateral ties since Western economic sanctions came into effect. Well, now, Armenian President Serge Sarkisian has called for the expansion of economic ties between Iran and the Eurasian Economic Union, the EEU. Sarkisian made the remarks during an EEU summit in the Russian capital Moscow on Friday. He also called for more investment to link Eurasian countries with the Persian Gulf region and Southeast Asia through Iran. The regional trading bloc was established in 2015 and is, comp and is comprised of Russia, Belarus, Armenia and Kazakhstan. The union is trying to attract more trading partners from Central Asia and Latin America. Russia is set to resume deliveries of its state of the art air defense system to Iran. Vladimir Putin has signed a decree that ends a five-year-old embargo. Now let's uh, get more details from RT's Medina Kochnova. So, Medina, what uh, has prompted this move? Uh, tell us more. Well, the uh, necessity for the embargo on S-300 air defense systems has fallen away as a result of uh, relations with Iran improving and of a recent breakthrough that was reached in Switzerland over Tehran's nuclear program. Now, that's according to Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. Now, the contract for supplying the S-300 was uh, first signed back, uh, was signed eight years ago, but then in uh, 2010, uh, the embargo was was introduced in a bit to uh, stimulate the talks between the six world powers and Iran over its nuclear program. And currently, the Russian President Vladimir Putin has given a go-ahead for delivery as the sides are getting closer to reaching a final agreement and lifting sanctions. Now, the Russian uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov uh, said that Iran needs the S-300 due to quite a tense situation in the region, and uh, he also that the equipment in question is purely defensive and it represents no threat to nearby countries including Israel now and at the moment all eyes are on Israel and its reaction on the news considering the fact that uh, the country always saw Iran as its main enemy Armadine, thanks so much for bringing us uh, the details and of course uh, we are monitoring the developments connected to this we get a caution over there Welcome back to The Real Story. Russian President Vladimir Putin defending the decision to send an advanced missile system to Iran. Well, that's a move the White House considers, of course, problematic. Kevin Cork, live on the North Lawn. So, Kevin, what's the administration saying about the sale of the so-called defensive missile system to Iran by the Russians? Yeah, I like how you put that, Gretchen. So-called defensive missile system. Well, the fact is, they're not happy about it. Clearly, it is a distraction. There's no question about that. But it also underscores the sort of complicated relationship between the White House and the Kremlin. On the one hand, clearly, the White House would say, well, they need Russia as part of the P5 plus one talks. On the other hand, they say, well, this is probably a reflection of the struggling Russian economy. They simply need the money. Well, I asked Josh Ernest about it in the briefing not long ago. Are the Russians friends? Are they foes? Are they frenemies? Are they somewhere in between? It just seems like there's always something. Well, uh, Kevin, the, we, I think we've articulated on a number of occasions that the United States does have a complicated relationship with Russia. And there are some areas where our two countries can work together very constructively in pursuit of interests that, are, uh, that benefit both our countries. 
which of course includes a number of areas of difference. Don't keep uh, forgetting, and I know a lot of people sometimes like to gloss over these things, but you have not just the missile sail, Gretchen, we're also talking about you know buzzing our aircraft, our reconnaissance aircraft, uh, other ways that, uh, for lack of a better description, that the Kremlin has sort of poked the uh, chest of the White House over the years that uh, Putin has been in office. It is a complicated relationship, to say the least. That is the understatement of the century. All right, uh, <laughs> Kevin Cork, live at the White House. Thank you. The fourth international security conference has opened in the Russian capital, Moscow. Representatives from more than 70 countries, including over 10 defense ministers and delegates from six international organizations, are taking part in the event. Threats to global security and areas of international cooperation are high on the agenda. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu opened the conference by describing NATO's expansion in Eastern Europe as a threat to Russia. He also noted that NATO countries are seeking to size the geopolitical space by approaching Russia's borders. The Russian official also warned about U.S. missile system in Eastern Europe. Our predictions about the U.S. global missile system development voiced at the 2012 Moscow conference are coming true. We believe that the implementation of the American missile architecture carries a threat to global strategic stability. Iranian Defense Minister Hossein Dehkan, who was also present at the meeting, said Iran and Russia should include regular consultations to monitor the crisis in the Middle East. The Iranian official also noticed that terrorism, issues relating to drug trafficking, organized crime and other threats facing the Caucasus and Central Asia are the topics that could lead to regional cooperation and strengthen security ties between Russia and Iran. We should include the ongoing consultations in the agenda, analyze and monitor the ongoing crisis in the region. This cooperation will lead to stability and security in the region. He also urged India, Russia and China to counter NATO's plans to deploy missiles in Europe and said Tehran is ready to start consultations on the issue. We support the idea of developing a multilateral defense cooperation between China, Iran, Russia and India to counter the movement by NATO's eastward expansion and deployment of missile systems in Europe. Participating countries voiced their support for the territorial sovereignty of countries and expressed their opposition to any political and military intervention. The Iranian defense minister in particular rejected any foreign intervention in the region and said Iran would continue to work for its security and the security of the region region as a whole. Marina Kartonova, Press TV, Moscow. Russia is lifting its five-year ban on supplying missiles to Iran. The head of Iran's Security Council said he expects Russia to start shipping the S-300 air defense missile system by the end of this year. Waleed Faris is a Fox News Middle Eastern analyst. Also with me, Peter Brooks, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. Peter, I'd like to start with you first. Why is Russia making this decision now at a time when the U.S., other countries, Russia included, yeah. are trying to reach a nuclear deal with <laughs> Iran. Well, there's a lot of things at play here. One, of course, is money. One of Russia's uh, biggest export markets is arms sales. So they want the money uh, to s transfer these uh, weapon systems to Iran. They're also really unhappy about sanctions against them over Ukraine. This is still an issue of contention between Russia and the West. And I think, once again, it's a take a swipe at the United States, who would be very unhappy about this arms transfer that's been put off for five years. Deirdre, what this really does is gives Iran air defense capability. If for some reason someday this deal falls through or there's a need to take military action, Iran will be better off or better capable of defending itself against uh, an American or an Israeli. Israeli or some other uh, air campaign. So, Peter, when you say that the U.S. is not exactly thrilled with this plan, it's clear as you outline <laughs> the reasons why. Right. Well, Ed, if this sale goes through, I mean, what does this mean for Iran's military strength? As Peter was just talking about, I'm thinking of it more in the civil war context. I mean, Iran is already backing rebels in Yemen, also backing President Assad in Syria. So that's basically two civil wars where more weapons could go in. Well, Two things could happen and will happen once those missiles will reach the Iranian regime, and we spoke about it actually a year ago. Number one, and precisely, our deterrence over the Iranian regime will be over or will be very weak, uh, as uh, our colleague has mentioned. Those weapons will be surrounding the potential targets, meaning uh, nuclear sites, 
long-range missile sites and also other military equipment of Iran that we can take out and with these missiles it's going to be very difficult so that move is going to weaken our uh, our uh, deal with them but number two as you just mentioned they're going to send those weapons to whatever they have expeditionary corps in Iraq in Syria in Lebanon and as far south as Yemen this is now transforming Iran into a regional power for sure and Peter, on that note, is this a done deal? I mean, having worked at the Secretary of Defense, is there anything that the U.S. can do in this situation? Not much. Uh, I mean, the Russians, now, we don't have all the facts yet. This is being talked about. It's talked about it might be an oil for food deal, a barter deal. Um, and then there's even been some saying that this could take a few years. My sense is, is that the Russians are talking about this, the Iranians are talking about this, to put pressure on the nuclear negotiators and also on the West over Ukraine. So there's a lot of dynamics going on here. So and Peter, I guess we won't yeah, know till we see them in place. I was just going to say that oil for food idea is very very interesting because Russia yeah. itself has been punished by the U.S. and as you just mentioned for the aggression in Ukraine and so therefore needs the money I'm assuming now more than ever. Sure. Yeah, I mean Russia needs a hundred and twenty dollar barrel of oil to meet its debts. Uh, it doesn't have that. Iran is also in a similar tough situation. So, you know, a barter deal is really interesting. I'm not sure if the experts agree that it's going to happen. But, you know, if you're talking about food and oil and things like that instead of cash payments, that's a very interesting uh, concept. Well, getting back to you, and let's just say that if the U.S. is not able to block, whether via financial incentives or other, this sale of basically a missile system to Iran, what does it mean for the region? I know you highlighted these areas of conflict, but I mean, does it make Israel's argument stronger that here you do have Iran getting stronger and basically, listen up world, we told you this was the wrong direction to go in? It will make the Israeli argument stronger, but a little bit late in the process because Israel's only cap capacity against Iran is from the air and from sub submarines. So this is precisely a deterrence also against the Israelis. It will make any strike by the Israelis alone, even by the United States, much more uh, costly. But think of the financial aspect of it. Where would they get the cash? Guess where the Iranian regime are going to be getting the cash to in undergo this operation? From the $130 billion, this new nuclear deal is going to release to them. So it's, it's the money we are going to be releasing to them. They're going to be using it to buy weapons from Russia and maybe from other countries in the future. It sounds crazy and probably true or likely. Is there anything, Waleed, if you were advising, let's say, President Obama right now, that you would say, if there's one thing you can do to change the situation, it is this? The problem with the administration is that they are dead set on the agreement. They think the agreement will solve many things. So it's going to be very difficult, actually, to convince the president and his administration to change the course. And if we don't change the course, it will be difficult to put any veto on an agreement between Russia and Iran that's outside the scope of the U.S. deal with Iran. Peter, asking you the same question with all of these moving parts. And as you said, we still don't know mm. every single thing that there is to know in this potential right. sale of weapons from Russia to Iran. But if there is one thing that the U.S. could control and should control at this juncture, what would it be? There's not much left. Uh, unfortunately, Walid is, Walid is correct. I mean, U.S.-Russia relations are terrible. They're frosty, almost Cold War-like, so Russia's not going to listen. But they also need Russia for the Iran deal, because uh, uh, Russia's talking about building nuclear reactors there. So there isn't much that we can do about that other, making, other than making diplomatic representations to the Russians to hold off until we have a final nuclear deal. But uh, I'm not so sure about that. Thank you both very much for your perspective and your insight. Glad to have you here. Wally Thanks Ferris joining us there, Fox News Middle East analyst, and Peter Brooks, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. Hello and welcome to the interview here on France 24. Our guest today is the chairman of the uh, Russian State Duma Committee on International Affairs, Alexei Pushkov. Mr. Pushkov, welcome to the France 24 Hello. interview. I want uh, to get to the issue of uh, Iran. There was recently a, well, at least a partial deal on the nuclear uh, issue in uh, Switzerland. Uh, Russia has just decided uh, that it will lift the ban on the delivery of defense missile system known as the S. 300. Uh, this was suspended five years ago. It's particularly because of those uh, negotiations. This has prompted criticism from Washington, from Jerusalem, that it was much too early to trust Iran with such 
weapons? Well, What's your response? The sanctions um, were introduced by the United Nations in 2007, which prohibited the del delivery of military technology to uh, Iran, and Russia was obedient. We followed those sanctions, but now the situation is different. Now, uh, already. Uh, I think so, yes. I think the um, agreement is being taken both uh, seriously by all sides, including Tehran and including the administration of Obama. I really trust the administration of Obama will not back away from this agreement. And by June 30, we'll have a text. And after this, I think the sanctions introduced by the United Nations will be removed. So the Russian decision to deliver S-300 to Iran will come into force. I mean, physically, they will be uh, delivered probably not earlier than by the end of 2015 beginning 2016. By that time, if the political process goes uh, in the right direction, there will be no more UN sanctions prohibiting uh, delivery of the delivery of military equipment to Iran. So we'll be in full compliance with the international but law. But what's, what's the goal? What's the goal? Is to protect Iran from an attack by Israel or the United States against its nuclear facilities? Is that's that's a good question, because you know that uh, the United States uh, and also Israel have been saying that uh, they consider a possible military scenario of uh, solving the issue by attacking nu uh, Iran nuclear facilities. And I know that some people in the United States are exercising some pressure on Obama that he goes back to the military scenario. And also in Israel, we know that the government of Israel is radically against this agreement. So there may be a temptation to kill this agreement by attacking Iran. If uh, Iran's defense capacities are boosted, maybe it will be a turn off for those who would like to kill the agreement. So I think that this is exactly reinforcing the um, possibilities and the, the chances for peace and for, for the implementation of the agreement with, with Iran. And uh, I think that uh, by boosting uh, Ukraine defense, and this is a defensive weapon, you cannot attack with C-300, I think we are giving a better chance for peace uh, around Iran and uh, in the Middle East in general. Very quickly, you must have noted that Hillary Clinton has decided uh, that she wants to be uh, the next president of the United States. You've criticized her, especially uh, on Syria, uh, saying, quote unquote, that she was probably uh, responsible for the tragedy and also for the emergence of uh, the uh, organization of the Islamic State. What did you have in mind? Well, I had in mind that by promoting democracy in Syria, uh, Hillary Clinton was behind a policy of supporting uh, extremist, uh, radical Islamist movements in uh, Syria, which now have formed the Islamic State. And so she's a mother-in-law, in a way, of the Islamic uh, State, which now the Americans are bombing. Uh, maybe it was an unintended uh, intended consequence of her policy, but it happened. Uh, and uh, if uh, Hillary Clinton espoused a more... Uh, a more reasonable approach to Syria. I don't think the Islamic State would have appeared. So I think that her um, foreign policy, at least, was not very convincing. And you're afraid that she would not be a responsible president? Well, I'm not afraid of anything. I know that people change. And I know that uh, we have seen world leaders who started with one set of ideas and then changed for the better. So let's hope if she's elected, she will change for the better. And that Russia and American relations will come back to the very tense situation that they're in? Well, they are in such a bad situation now that I cannot see that they become worse. So we can move only for, for some bettering of the relationship. If Mrs. Clinton displays a desire to stop this uh, uh, meaningless uh, and senseless policy of isolation of Russia, I think we have good chances to, to come back to better relationship. Alexei Pushkov, thank you very much. That's all we have time for. Thank you for watching this edition of the interview here on France 24. Welcome to Worlds Apart. The provisional Iranian nuclear deal and Russia's decision to provide the S-300 missile systems to Tehran could potentially change the balance of power in the Middle East. Could they lead to more stability or, on the contrary, tip the scales towards conflict? Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by Iran's defense minister, Hussein Dehkan. Minister, thank you very much for being with us today. We really appreciate that. Russia just announced that it no longer wants to wait uh, with the delivery of the S-300 missile systems to Tehran. And that news sparked a lot of in different interpretations about Moscow's motives. Some believe that it's uh, a way of um, encouraging Iran for the progress that it's uh, made with the P5 plus one. Others believe that it's a way of essentially spiting the Americans. What do you think uh, is Moscow trying to achieve here? What do you think are Moscow's motives? 
In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, thank you for the opportunity to discuss these extremely important issues. The issue of the S-300 system is an old one between Russia and Iran. We had already signed a contract with Russia for the purchase of this system. Six years ago, the Russian president suspended the contract. Naturally, we have been asking for the contract to be performed ever since. At that time, we sent some experts to Russia. They were trained on both the technical and the practical aspects of the system, and they returned to Iran. In addition, we prepared the proper structures for the system in Iran. In other words, we were prepared to receive the system based on the contracts that we had signed. Our position has always been to seek the performance of the contract. In the new administration of President Rouhani, several meetings were held between the presidents of the two countries, where they discussed the performance of the contract. And in the end, it was agreed that the contract... So do you believe that's because of the uh, efforts that the new government of Iran has done? Do you think that's because uh, Moscow finds it uh, perhaps uh, geopolitically beneficial for it to make this move right now, or perhaps of the actions of some other actors? Who do you think was the impetus for, the, for, for this deal? Let me explain the process. Then, if you have any questions, I will answer them. We raised the issue of this contract at various negotiations and meetings between the presidents of the two countries. The Russian party announced that there were some limitations, indicating that the former president of Russia had suspended the contract. And in accordance with the Russian government's tradition, the current president usually refrains from cancelling orders given by his predecessor. In the end, it was said that the current president has the same authorities as his predecessor, so he must have the power to do this. Then we discussed ways in which both parties could execute the contract with Mr. Shoigu on the sidelines of last year's security conference. Finally, during Mr. Shoigu's trip to Iran, we agreed with Mr. Shoigu that we should make all of the preparations before my trip to Russia for the current conference, so that we could execute the contract. Well, all of these arrangements were made, and two weeks ago, the esteemed president of Russia issued a statement indicating that Russia had agreed to deliver the system to Iran based on the contract we had previously concluded. Now, whether the acceptance was subject to external factors and whether it was related to the P5 plus 1 talks, that needs to be analyzed. From our point of view, it was because of the new conditions created in the relations between the two countries, as well as the political determination of both sides to improve relations in all areas. Minister, with all due respect, I don't think it's uh, an exclusively bilateral issue. I think it has m many more other geopolitical implications. And one possible explanation for that deal, at least discussed here in Moscow, is an effort to provide a deterrent against uh, a unilateral action by Israel, something that the Israeli leadership has been uh, very publicly discussing, a strike against Iranian nuclear facilities. Now, I know that to many Iranians that is a very offensive language, but rather than discussing it, I would like to ask you, as a defense minister, do you think the possession of those missile systems constitutes uh, a big enough deterrent for your country? Do you think uh, Israel could be, uh, well, I don't know, scared away or forced to reconsider some of its actions because of these specific systems? Well, thank God and thanks to the human, technical and industrial capacities we have in our own country, we do have the necessary defense systems to guarantee our aerospace security. We have even designed and are now building a system similar to this one, and we expect to be able to test its production model by the end of the current Iranian year. As I have stressed to the Russian party repeatedly, what was and still is the most important thing for us is the fulfillment of the contract once it has been signed. Today, we consider the acceptance as Russia's decision to fulfill its obligations to Iran under the S-300 contract. The question of whether we need such systems to counteract Israel or to guarantee our nuclear security, should be considered from the perspective that every country seeks to have access to various systems that it deems necessary to meet its defense and security needs. And likewise, in order to meet such needs, Iran doesn't need to make arrangements with any authorities, nor does it need to ask anyone's permission. Iran will make the decision on its own and will implement it on its own. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Russian President Vladimir Putin was asked about uh, the provision of uh, S-300s to Iran, and his answer was very interesting. He said that uh, uh, in his influence may have been uh, also led by considerations of uh, the assistance being a deterrent, a deterrent factor in connection with the situation in Yemen. And I find this slightly unusual because we only heard them I mean, over the last couple of years about Iran. But do you think there was he was referring to the possibility of a unilateral strike by Saudi Arabia against Iran and perhaps as a result of a spillover from the from the Yemeni conflict? Do you even consider that as a possibility, as a threat? No. no. There is no connection between these two issues, because the decision about the performance of the contract was made long before the events taking place in the south of the Persian Gulf, namely the attack by Saudi Arabia and its allies on Yemen. Therefore, this is not related. Whether Israel will or will not attack us now that we have this system is the political aspect of the issue. For us, the technical and operational aspects of the contract were most important. In my opinion, giving a political color and flavor to this contract kind of deflects from the real issue, because the issue is clear. There was a contract which was suspended for some time under certain circumstances. And now, under different circumstances, the same contract has been revived. From our point of view, the only reason for such a decision was the determination of both parties to fulfill their mutual obligations. But now, for example, what Israel does, or what the United States of America does, or what some country has said, or what becomes of Saudi Arabia, all that has nothing to do with this issue. It's quite natural for analysts to make assumptions and guesses in their analyses, because they are looking at the issue from their own angles. From our point of view, the reason is that we have decided to create the necessary infrastructure for our country based on our own conditions, and one of the results of that decision was to purchase the S-300 system. Now, uh, speaking about uh, securing your country, both the aerospace and uh, more broadly, for years the main axis of enmity was between uh, Iran and the United States. Uh, some of your leaders refer to the United States as this great Satan. The American leadership was also, um, you know, not very kind in describing Iran as a irrational theocracy. But it seems that right now the rhetoric coming out uh, of uh, traditional American allies, I mean, both the Saudi Arabia and Israel, is far more belligerent than the le rhetoric coming out of. Washington. If we put aside uh, the rhetoric, who do you think represents a greater danger to the security of your country? Is it Washington or is it perhaps some of its allies? We don't feel threatened by our neighbors, nor have we ever posed a threat to them. We do respect the political independence and territorial integrity of our neighboring countries, and we believe that a powerful Iran will be a promoter of stability and security in the region. We consider our capabilities an asset for the Islamic world. So, if Israel and the United States try to depict Iran as a threat to the countries of the region, they are doomed to fail, because we have never, throughout our history, invaded any neighboring countries. On the contrary, we have strongly resisted any invasion of our own country. A recent example was Iraq's invasion of Iran. Both the East and the West, including the former Soviet Union, the United States, France and all other Western countries, they all supported Saddam Hussein and Iraq's invasion in different ways. However, our nation retaliated and defeated Iraq without the help or support of any foreign country. Iran was the winner in the war with Iraq because we prevented the enemy from imposing their will on us. Therefore, we are not a threat to the countries of the region, nor do we consider them a threat against us. We believe that neither the United States nor Israel would dare to attack us. If they believed that they could manage a war or an attack against us, they would have done so without a shadow of a doubt. The fact that they have not already attacked us shows that they have not been able to. In reply to your question about whether Saudi Arabia or other neighboring countries who have security treaties with the United States are capable of acting against us, we believe that they are not capable of doing so, nor do they enjoy such broad popular and political support for an attack or a coalition against us.
Well, uh, American public opinion is not always the most crucial thing that American uh, or Western leaders concern themselves with. But today at the conference, and we are speaking at the, on the sidelines of Moscow Security Conference, you made a very interesting uh, statement. You said that uh, Iran supports the idea of multifaceted cooperation between China, India, Russia, uh, and perhaps some other countries as a way of counterbalancing NATO. Uh, expansion and also to counterbalance the deployment of a missile shield in, in Europe. And for many years we've been hearing that this missile shield is aimed at de you know, deterring Iranian threat that you say doesn't exist. Now, there, there's been some progress in your talks with the P5 plus one. There's been some kind of rapprochement with the Americans. If the deal on the Iranian nuclear program is reached, and that's primarily the deal between you and the Americans, would there still be the need for these uh, multifaceted alliance that you talked about? This is the traditional and wrong view about our relations with China, Russia, and the United States. Basically, the world has gone through serious changes. Today's Islamic Iran is not the same as it was in the time of the Shah. We do not see the United States the way that it would have been seen then. First of all, I would say to you that if you follow the news, you must have heard the President of the United States literally saying, we have taken every possible action against Iran, however, our measures have not proven effective. So the only option we have is to negotiate with Iran to resolve the nuclear issues. And we have officially said that no other issues will be on the agenda of our negotiations with the P5 plus one group, especially with the United States. Naturally, we would not allow the scope of the negotiations to cover any issues other than the nuclear one. So that's why we are now negotiating with the P5 plus one group, and those talks were organized by the United States. I should repeat that nothing other than the nuclear issue will be on the agenda of the negotiations. So therefore, I cannot say that our relations with the United States will develop towards excellent cooperation. Of course, if Americans, as a country and as a nation, take a constructive position towards other countries, including Iran, we do not see any obstacles to the establishment of normal ties with them. However, basically, Americans have a fundamental political and philosophical difference with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Therefore, reconciliation between the two countries, Americans are trying to extend their hegemony over the world. They seek to plunder other nations. They are trying to impose their own culture and interests upon the political arena of the world. We are fundamentally opposed to such a view. Therefore, it's a fact that we cannot cooperate with the United States. China and Russia are in exactly the opposite position. Iran, China and Russia all share common threats at a regional level and have similar goals at the international level. Based on these common threats and goals, we can establish long-term strategic cooperation. That's a very broad statement. I didn't get, though, from your answer if you are indeed willing to cooperate with China, India and Russia in the security sphere. Is that something that you're looking at or perhaps you've been misquoted in the Russian media? Well, this is an idea. It enjoys good support in theory, as well as having a solid and logical basis. Naturally, it needs to be developed. It should be changed into a discourse and then organized and put into action. Thank you. Um, I would also like to ask you about the situation uh, that is closer to home for you. I I'm talking about the Saudi military strikes against Yemen, and while Washington publicly at least uh, supports the Saudi uh, initiative, I know that there are many policymakers within uh, Washington who are very ambivalent about what is going on, not only because of the legality of the whole action, but also the consequences. Uh, who do you think at this point of time could contain Riyadh? Uh, and uh, because, I mean, uh, from our perspective, it doesn't seem like Washington has a big leverage with Saudi Arabia at the moment, or at least it's not seems to be willing, it doesn't seem to be willing to uh, apply that leverage. We would advise Saudi Arabia and its allies that their military invasion will not have any positive outcomes for them. Instead of using the assets of Islamic nations to wage war amongst themselves, it would be better to use such assets to counteract the main enemy of Islam, 
namely Israel. With regard to why the United States encouraged Saudi Arabia to invade Yemen, it is clear that it results from a strategic view of the geopolitics of the region, because the Gulf of Aden and the Bab el-Mandeb Strait play a strategic role in the region, and a huge volume of the world's economic exchange depends on them. Therefore, this region is vital for the Americans. They think that what the Yemeni nation wants, that is, an independent country with a democratically elected government, that it cannot satisfy the United States' interests in this vital region. Therefore, the U.S. is going against the will of the Yemeni nation and its desire to establish an independent national government. Americans consider this a threat against them, and this is an incorrect belief. As I said in my speech this morning, this is a strategic error in perception. I mean, neither the United States nor Saudi Arabia have the correct view of the circumstances. In fact, the Americans have instilled such an idea into Saudi Arabia and encouraged it to take the actions that it has. In the beginning, some countries declared that they would cooperate with Saudi Arabia. However, when they saw the real circumstances in practice, they withdrew and refrained from taking part in the operations. Saudi Arabia and its allies have bombed the Yemeni nation's infrastructure and have prevented aid from other countries from reaching this nation, which has been invaded and subjected to relentless massacres. And unfortunately, Saudi Arabia and its allies do not agree to any restrictions on their attacks against the Yemeni people. As to whether the bombing campaign will help Saudi Arabia succeed and, in other words, lead the Yemeni nation to surrender, I would say that the answer is no. Saudi Arabia has previously waged wars and invaded Yemen four times. In all the previous wars, the Yemeni nation won and Saudi Arabia was defeated. I think that if Saudi Arabia does not stop its attack on Yemen, and if it fails to let the Yemeni people determine their own destiny based on their own will and without the intervention of other countries, then this invasion will also have severe consequences for Saudi Arabia. Minister, I have to ask you though, uh, it's not a secret that uh, Iran has good ties with the Houthis and I know that some of that, uh, your involvement there has been primarily humanitarian, helping to build schools, helping to build hospitals, but uh, there are also reports about, you know, training uh, some of the forces and weapon supplies. And let's be honest here, I think the, the, we, we hear so, such claims in every single conflict, you know, about Russia's involvement in Ukraine, about Turkey's involvement in Syria, about Americans and American involvement everywhere. So. Um, I think it would be a bit perhaps disingenuous to claim that some of that never happens because everybody pretty much does that. But I would like to ask you though, what do you think the limits of that involvement should be? Not only in terms of the Iranian involvement in Yemen, but more broadly geopolitically, what are the rules of an engagement or involvement in a foreign country where you may have interest, legitimate interest? Let me ask you a question. Was it the Americans and Israelis who trained, equipped and organized Takfiri and Zionist groups and terrorists, or was it somebody else? Because if you were present at that conference today, you would have seen that we played a video in which Mrs. Clinton officially declares that we ourselves organized such groups to counteract the Soviet Union's presence in Afghanistan. Then they were transformed into the Taliban, who then formed Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda in turn became ISIS. So therefore it was the Americans, the Israelis and unfortunately the reactionary countries of the region who helped the process of forming, organizing and supporting the terrorist groups. Now, what is the result? Firstly, the capacities and potential of the Islamic world are being degraded as a result of a series of criminal actions. The infrastructure of Muslim countries is being devastated and Muslims are killing Muslims. Meanwhile, Israel and the United States stand by and watch the scene play out, which guarantees their interests without any cost to them. As to our position on Syria, Iraq and Yemen, 
I should say that we have officially declared that we will stand by and help any country invaded or threatened by the United States and Israel, provided that the government or the nation of that country asks for help. Such an approach has been recognized in international law and there are no obstacles to it, even in the Charter of the United Nations. Americans and Saudi Arabia are invaders because they have violated all of the globally accepted norms and protocols. We have not invaded any country. If a government asked us for help, we have helped it. And if it had not asked for help, we did not help it on our own. As to whether we train and equip the Houthis, I should say that the Houthis are already adequately equipped themselves, especially because all of the government institutions, including the army and administrative systems of Yemen, are cooperating with them. Firstly, the Houthis are acting under their supervision. Secondly, the Houthis are not seeking to govern the country themselves. Rather, they are saying that Yemen is being governed by a corrupt government and system and that such a government is not qualified to rule over the Yemeni nation. The Yemeni nation has decided to establish a government based on its own will. The Houthis only make up around 40% of Yemen's population. Today, it's the Yemeni nation who is standing against the invasion in a unified and coordinated way. Otherwise, a civil war could have immediately broken out, for example, between the Houthis and other religious groups. However, as we can see, such a civil war has not broken out. The only people fighting the army and the Houthis are some Al-Qaeda-related groups or some of the supporters of Mr. Mansour. Nevertheless, the Yemeni nation is becoming more united and its decision and will to realize its goals is becoming increasingly galvanized. Therefore, Saudi Arabia has not attacked the Houthis, it has attacked Yemen. It is not massacring the Houthis, it is massacring the Yemeni nation. Saudi Arabia is not just targeting the areas which are under Houthi control, but rather it has invaded all of the territory of Yemen. So this claim that Yemen was invaded because of the Houthis' support for Iran is not correct. In my opinion, Saudi Arabia attacked Yemen with the green light and support of the United States and Israel, because the Yemeni nation wants independence and wants to determine its own destiny, and that would deprive the Americans and Saudi Arabia of this strategic region. Minister, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. I really, really appreciate you being on the show. And if you have any questions, please share them on our Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook pages. And I hope to see you again, same place, same time.